So here we go with, with test three. Uh, thank you very much to everybody uh, today for being online. And uh, thank you to those of you who picked this up and watch it on video as well. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker of today, uh, which is Milind Tambe. Um, Milind, I regard not only as a colleague, but also as a friend. I'm just going to kill some sound here. I've got some background sound. Let me just get rid of that. Just bear with me. Okay, I'm back with you, Milind. I'll keep an eye on the sound. Uh, we, we just want to make the best possible recording, so that's why we'll keep the, mi the microphones muted down. So yes, Milind, somebody I regard as a, as a friend. I've spent time with Milind out in uh, Mumbai and uh, always enjoy his company. He's a great host, Milind. Um, Milind was regional director of the IMS uh, India branch for, I don't know how many years actually, Milind, a number of years and oh, yes. um, uh, stood down now and I'm very envious because he tells me he's going trekking in the Himalayas tomorrow. So I uh, wish you good luck with that. Thanks. So, Thanks, Millind is a, uh, a big ship, a commercial ship surveyor, but has a very keen interest in small boats. I know you haven't got around to buying one and as far as I know, I know you were keen to buy a small boat, but haven't got around to it yet, Millind, as far as I know. Um, but photography is something that crosses a over the whole marine surveying divide. So it doesn't really matter whether you're taking photos on big ships, offshore installations, small yachts, motorboats, whatever. And it's really with that in mind that I've asked Milind to talk to us today. So I've gone on far too long already. Without further ado, Milind, uh, welcome and over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thanks for this uh, wonderful opportunity for the Marine Surveying International Fest season three. Um, a warm welcome to everyone who's online. A warm welcome to also all those who would be watching this presentation and the whole uh, Marine Surveying Fest as a video recording later on. Welcome uh, to IIMS. It's, it's an excellent uh, thing that Mike has started to have an online uh, seminar, which in these days of COVID, we are not able to have a physical seminars. So this, this is an excellent thing to do. So, well, yes, here we are. Uh, Mike uh, gave a little uh, introduction of mine. Yes, I am quite keen uh, photographer myself along with what uh, little surveying I do. Uh, and you all would rather agree that in today's world, there is, there is none of us who doesn't do photography in some form of a, or other. As surveyors, yes, we, we do resort to taking images uh, more or less for record shots. Maybe some of you who are doing um, expert witness cases, you must be doing it for other uh, evidentiary purposes as well. We have had a similar presentation into the first season of uh, the Marine Fest. So I'm not uh, basically going to uh, repeat that same presentation. A part of this presentation though is quite similar to what was there in the first session, but uh, a majority of it has been changed and adopted uh, to include some new things some some different subjects and uh, let's let's make a start to the presentation before i start the presentation i would just like to quote uh, a great photographer painter and a uh, professor from the baha school who said knowledge of photography is just as important as that of the alphabet the illiterate of the future will be ignorant of the use of camera and pen alike how thoughtful isn't it? He said this way back in 1923 and, and that's what it is today. We all take pictures, may it be for our uh, professional use, may it be for our family purposes or social gatherings. We all take pictures and we all know how to take pictures. But the important matter here is, do we really know how to take pictures in the right way or make use of our uh, imaging gadgets in the right way? And that's a big question now because uh, all these camera manufacturers, gadget manufacturers keep updating and upgrading their devices so often that it becomes virtually impossible for each one of us to master every new gadget that comes. But the best part of the whole thing is that we have certain features which are very common in all of these gadgets. So if we are able to master those certain elements, no matter which camera or which imaging device you use, it's going to be easy to take 
pictures and get uh, results which are equally uh, consistent throughout all gadgets. Let's see what those things are. And I'm sure each one of us uh, here on, online and who are watching uh, later on uh, as a video recording would have come across this particular dilemma in some point and time in the professional lives as to which camera should I buy? What is, what is the right camera for me as a surveyor? Well, I, I won't give you a ready-made answer. It's, it's very difficult because it all depends on what kind of uh, survey assignments you all take. But let's, let's see uh, what, what are the different types of cameras and what are the pros and cons so that you're able to make an informed decision as to what type of uh, imaging device is right for you. We all go with either one of these imaging devices, right? I mean, you either have a mobile phone or you might have a DSLR or a mirrorless camera, which is comparatively a newcomer into the market or a normal compact camera, one of these what you see on the screens. Let's see what are the pros and cons of each one of them, except for the uh, mobile phone, because mobile phone is something which we do not want to discuss because there are a lot many cons of mobile phones than pros. So we will, we will stick to these two types of cameras, which are the compacts and the DSLR and the mirrorless. DSLR and mirrorless are more or less similar. So when I'm referring to a DSLR, also keep in mind that similar aspects apply to a mirrorless camera as well. Let's, let's see what are the pros and cons of each one of these. You know, the pros of a DSLR camera. Uh, DSLR cameras usually have a very large sensor. A sensor is an equivalent of film of the analog uh, days. You know, if, uh, if you remember, you had uh, the uh, SLRs and the medium format cameras, which you used to see like this down with a big 120 mm uh, film. Uh, those, those bigger uh, film cameras used to give you a better uh, result, a better image quality. The same happens with SLR. The SLR has a very large sensor. Uh, the, the full frame cameras have a sensor of the same dimensions as of film. So, so the kind of resolution that you get, so the kind of image quality that you get with DSLRs is, is really excellent. Another good aspect of uh, DSLRs is you can change lenses. Say for example, if you're into a compact space like a, like, like a small little boat, a 20, 22 feet of boat with uh, just a small beam of six feet, seven feet, and you've got to take an whole expanse uh, of the boat from the port to starboard standing into the companion way. I mean, switching over to a wide angle lens onto a DSLR camera is much more easier. At the same time, if you are out on the hard and you want, to, you want to capture a long shot and yet at the same time zoom in into a particular aspect uh, of the boat, you could change to a telephoto lens and zoom in and take a good picture. So that's, that's the plus point of uh, the DSLR camera. The second thing is the processes in the DSLR camera are very fast, like like our faster computers, like the faster chips. Uh, the DSLR images, the DSLR cameras are able to capture and record images much faster than the compact cameras. So that that becomes very important, especially when we are doing uh, things like um, you know, say say for example, a boat is being lowered into the water, and you want to take sequential photographs one after the other at, at a fast pace. A DSLR camera comes very handy because it can shoot and record images at a much faster rate. DSLR cameras invariably will have an optical viewfinder. The advantage of having an optical viewfinder is that you save onto your batteries. You are actually seeing what the scene is and capturing it. So that's that's a plus point of having an optical viewfinder. Many a times with uh, uh, cameras which don't have a viewfinder and you have to fiddle onto the screen and uh, have a look at the pictures. Uh, Mike, may I request to uh, mute your... Uh, hi, Mike. Mike, can you hear me? Can you please mute your uh, microphone? I, I, I can hear it. Can uh, you please... My... Okay. Yeah, thanks, thanks. That's good. Okay, with the optical viewfinder, you always are able to see the scene as it is happening. When you try to see the same uh, image uh, or rather the scene onto your LCD background, say for example, you're standing into a very bright area and, and then you would have noticed that sometimes you can't see your mobile screen the same way you can't see the image that's happening onto your uh, DSLR camera or the LCD screen of the camera. So that's where an optical viewfinder comes into play and it's an advantage. Uh, 
DSLR cameras and their sensors have a wide range of ISO. ISO setting is nothing but the receptibility of light onto the sensor. If, if the ISO range is very high, that's if the ISO number goes from, normally it would range from 100, 200, 400, 800, 600, and, and so on till up to 12,000 or 15,000. On some advanced cameras, it's even 26,000 ISO. So the advantage with this is, if you have a higher limit of an ISO, you are capable of taking relatively good pictures, even in darker situations. Uh, it may not be so much of an importance for a small craft surveyor, but for a uh, big ship surveyor, especially when they go into ballast tanks, and uh, when you pop a flash, you would always see uh, you know blobs of light, which is basically because of the because of the moisture that's around into the tank, you get uh, those kind of white uh, spots and specks onto your picture. But if you have a high ISO, you can take a picture without a flash popping up. So that's that's a plus point of the DSLR that you have a wide range of ISO settings. DSLR cameras also have manual controls. Having manual controls means you can precisely control your exposure the way you want, the depth of field you want, the shutter speed you want. So, so it, it gives you a more creative control. I will not elaborate too much onto this because all these particular small uh, details are given um, into the handbook that IMS publishes, what a, a marine surveyor knows to know about digital imaging. You can always refer to that book because if, if I if I divert to that particular aspect, we will lose the essence of this presentation. So I'm not going to go into the exposure modes and all those things here, but I'll just give you a hint that these manual controls give you a much more creative control over to your image making. So that's that's another good aspect. As I said, depth of field control. It is very important to have a depth of field control. What is depth of field basically? Depth of field is nothing. Say, say for example, you have, you have this particular uh, mobile phone with me sitting at the back. Now, Say this is this is a faulty uh, part of the board. You want to just uh, take a picture of this, but at the same time keep everything behind that out of focus. So you can you can uh, take a shallow depth of field by opening up the aperture, just focusing onto this camera, making everything that's behind the camera or behind behind this particular phone out of focus, thereby directing the attention of the viewer to the main aspect of the image. So this this is one of those creative controls. Again because you can change multiple lenses you can ensure that you use the best optics the best lenses onto your uh, camera so thereby again giving you a nice creative control and uh, good image quality by using the dslr cameras having said all these good things there are also some cons of these uh, dslr cameras let's see what are those generally these cameras are very high priced uh, you know, especially for places like uh, the, the South Asia, the Southeast Asian countries where there's a high customs duty. After duty, these cameras become a deterrent to buy. Let, let me be honest about it. Second con of this is they are very heavy and large. A, a entry level DSL, a DSLR camera would not weigh anything less than one and a half kg, which is quite heavy from a service perspective, right? I mean, you've got to go up and down the ladders, and if you're carrying a camera that's that heavy, it's, it's going to be cumbersome after a certain point of time. So they are quite heavy. Uh, they have high maintenance as well because, because you can change the lenses, you can change various modules onto the cameras. What happens is they get exposed to dust and uh, you need to ensure that your sensors are dust free. Of late, there are quite a lot of cameras which are uh, weather resistant, weather sealed, but again, they are much more costlier. So, there, there is an element of maintenance. Every, every, uh, uh, after every assignment, you may have to clean a sensor depending on what kind of environments you're working into. But yes, that, that does cost. And not all maintenance can be done by the user. At times, you've got to get, give this uh, DSLR cameras to the dedicated uh, manufacturers' workshops where they calibrate the shutters and the apertures, etc. So, so it's, it's a bit of a hassle. DSLR cameras are quite noisy. I mean, as compared to a normal phone or a compact camera, DSLR cameras, when you click a picture, are very, very noisy. I mean, they would make a lot of noise, which sometimes may not be desirable. So this is one aspect that we need to keep in mind that they are noisy. DSLR cameras also have a steep learning curve. They, they are not as easy as a compact to operate. If, if you have a good learning curve, a sharp, sharp uh, steep learning curve where you quickly uh, master all the controls, there's nothing like a DSLR. But yes, 
you need to learn because many a times what happens is people go uh, out with an enthusiasm to buy a DSLR and then later on come and find that they're not able to uh, understand all the controls of the camera and then the pictures don't come out as good as that uh, they should have come or what they, they perceive them that they would come once they buy a DSLR camera. So there is a, there is a bit of a learning that's involved into the DSLR camera. So if you're, if you're prepared to uh, go through that learning curve, DSLR camera is one of the best cameras that you can invest in. Let's see the pros and cons of a compact camera. Now, this is, this is just an illustration that I have shown you here, a compact camera, that there are different types of compact cameras. It, it all depends on what brand, what make, what features that you want in the camera. But this is one of the simplest that you see on this screen. What are the pros of this camera? The biggest pro is the size and weight. They're very handy. You can simply slip them into your shirt pocket and go out for a uh, survey. They're as light as a few hundred grams and they're very easy to carry. You can always uh, sling them up onto your shoulder and climb up a mast. No hassles, but with a DSLR, that would be a little difficult. They're much quieter in operation as compared to the DSLRs or the mirrorless cameras. They're very, very quiet. They're just unobtrusive. They don't make the presence felt. So it's, at times, these are really good options to use as a surveyor. Most of the compact cameras will have auto modes. That is, there are, there are predefined modes into the camera which you can use into your surveying uh, activities which will help you get the best results out of them again these modes are beautifully explained into the book which i just referred you can you can have a read through that book and all each of these modes which are available in the compact camera are described in detail there these cameras are much moderately priced uh, i would say much affordable they're, they're quite affordable because even if you happen to break a camera or probably um, you know, well, put the camera in water for some uh, unknown reason. It is very easy to replace that camera. They're not that costly. The pros of this is LCD framing. As I said in the DSLR, that LCD at times is uh, detrimental. But with the modern compact cameras, LCD framings have improved to such an extent that at, at times with certain models, they are much better than the DSLR. But you've you got to know which models offer those features. These can be very uh, nice and effective, especially if you're in awkward uh, uh, inspection spaces. Uh, you know, like say for example, again, I'll give an example of you're onto a mast and, and you're looking, you, you are into a bosun's chair on this side of the mast and the forward end has a crack. It's very difficult for you to bend down and see what all that you can do is just flip the LCD of the, of the camera upwards direct the camera there, the camera LCD actually becomes like a screen for you to view what actually is onto the other side of the mask. So it's, it's an advantage in that sense, but not all compacts would offer good LCD schemes or tilting LCD. They, they call them as three way tilting LCD schemes. If any of your compact has that, that's, that's really an advantage. So these are the advantages of the compacts. Like the DSLR, there are some cons as well of uh, these cameras. The image quality is often very low when you compare that with the DSLR. And, and the reason is obvious. These cameras are much, much, much smaller. So being smaller, the sensor is also relatively smaller. So almost one fourth to two thirds of a DSLR camera. So you are cutting down onto the image quality there. So that is, that is one major drawback. These cameras, unlike the DSLRs, have a smaller ISO range. So they have their limitations when it comes to taking pictures into drone like uh, situations. So that's, that becomes a big handicap uh, at times if you're, you have, you're doing a survey in the dark hours or, or into areas which are poorly lit. Uh, these cameras may not perform uh, as good as a DSLR. Uh, these cameras also have a shutter lamp. You know, uh, quite often you'll see that you click the shutter, but that's not the precise moment when the camera is there recording the picture. It may record it a few milliseconds later. Even if it is a few milliseconds later, that, that delay of milliseconds at times could be detrimental because you want to take a picture of something happening right now and you're not able to because the camera has a little shutter lag is what they call as, as when taking the picture. So, so that's, that's one big uh, thing which you should keep in mind, especially if you're doing things related to action on board a boat or onto a ship, uh, that particular shutter lag aspect, you should be able to 
counter it. If you have been using that camera quite often, you will automatically know, yes, it, it takes about half a second for the camera to actually record. You might click the photograph in anticipation half a second before. But that, that happens with practice. But yes, that aspect, that drawback does exist. There are quite limited manual controls onto a camera, uh, compact camera. Of late, some of those uh, very, very advanced cameras do have manual controls, but there are very few of them. Not many uh, compact cameras will offer you fully manual control for the creative, uh, uh, creative aspects of uh, photography. They're much less adaptable. Uh, these cameras, you, you can't change the lens. As I said in the DSLR, if you're in a cramped space, you can do the, use a wide angle lens to take a, a picture of a boat from boat to boat. You can't do this into these cameras. But another uh, point of these cameras is most of these cameras come with a built-in zoom. So you can, you can have a wide angle as well as a zoomed in uh, photograph using the same camera without changing the lens, but at the cost of quality because those, those optics are not so much refined as uh, dedicated lenses for a DSLR camera. So you will have a wide angle to a telephoto capability onto a compact, but that will that will be limited. You can't change lenses onto this. You can't have a high quality optic fitted onto a, a compact camera if you want a specific uh, close-up shot or a macro shot of something that's cracked or you know a fissure onto a onto a shaft or something. No, you, it, it would be a little difficult to capture with these kind of cameras. What are some other factors that you should consider? Uh, apart from what we considered about the size, weight, quality, noise, and all those stuff that we saw, there are some other aspects which are very important when you select the camera. Uh, that is the format in which the camera can capture images. Basically, uh, cameras would capture uh, images either in J uh, JPEG, TIFF, or RAW. Uh, RAW and TIFF are relatively heavier files. They, they, these are non-compressed images. That is, there is a lot of detail available into the image files as compared to the JPEG uh, image. Now, uh, why is this important? Uh, basically because, uh, we will come to this part towards the end of the presentation, but I'll just give you a little hint. When you're doing your digital uh, asset management, when, when, when you're archiving your photos, and if you want an untouched copy of your image, a camera that can record raw and JPEG image or TIFF and JPEG image is always preferred over a camera which can just record a JPEG image. So some of us who are doing um, high value uh, surveys where things are likely to go into litigation or arbitration at some point of time, it is always good to ensure that you have a camera which can, which can uh, take pictures in both formats at the same time, raw as well as JPEG. Again, we will touch this aspect in detail a little later towards the end of the presentation. The next, next aspect, which is very, very, very important, is the internal buffer memory of a camera. It is, it is something like a RAM of your computer. When, when you're typing uh, something into the, on, on Word or Excel and you're computing certain things, there's an internal memory into your uh, PC, right? Which, which actually processes the whole thing and then puts the whole dump into your uh, hard drive. So similarly, every camera has got an internal buffer memory. So if you're taking pictures in succession, one after the other at a fast pace, and if the buffer memory of the camera is slow, your picture taking is going to be drastically slowed down. So when you, whenever you select your camera, the best thing to see is what is the buffer memory of the camera. Higher the buffer memory, the better the camera is in terms of capturing images in quick succession. So that is that is something which is very uh, important. Also with this buffer memory, what happens is, uh, after you take a picture, if you want to see it onto your display, if the buffer memory is high, that display would be popped up immediately. If the buffer memory is slow, that image would be popped up after a considerable period of time, and which means a loss of time for you as a surveyor. Uh, also an important aspect is how big a memory card can the camera take? Big in, it's not in terms of physical size, but big in terms of bytes. How many uh, GB worth of a card a camera can take? Because each of these cameras are limited by the number of GBs of the card that it can accept. If someone is doing just a day long uh, survey, maybe a camera which accepts an eight GB card, it's good enough. But just someone like me who goes on to an assignments of salvage and where 
there is no way that I can come back ashore before eight, 10 days and uh, there is no access to a laptop. Uh, I can't afford to uh, be carrying 10, 15, 8 GB cards for each day and taking pictures and then remembering which card is which. The best thing for me is to have a high GB card of a 32 GB or 64 GB or 128 GB and dump it into the camera and take it home. But then my camera should be able to uh, accept that kind of card. So that is another aspect which you should consider. Another thing is how long will the battery last in ideal conditions? When I'm saying ideal conditions is uh, your normal temperatures ranging between 10 to 20 degrees centigrade. What happens is with in colder climates, generally you must have observed that the batteries drain out much faster. So if your camera has a good quality battery, it will last you that much longer without having to recharge or without having to carry spare batteries. So that is another aspect which uh, you should seriously consider when selecting a new camera. A very important aspect about cameras and the battery charging is you should see if the camera allows and off the camera battery charging off the camera battery charging in the sense there are some cameras which you can only charge with a USB cable plugged into the camera and there are some cameras where you can have a standby battery which is put onto a charger it remains on charge while the time you by the time you click these pictures the other battery is already on charge so that gives you a backup battery to work with uh, when you are present battery exhausts. But if there are cameras which only charge uh, through an USB cable where the battery can't be uh, removed, it's a little handicap, isn't it? Because if your battery drains out, you've got to wait for the camera to charge. So this is another aspect which you should consider when you're buying a new camera. Megapixel. Now this is a big myth that you need higher megapixels uh, or, or higher the megapixels, the better the camera. It's, it's really a myth. So let me ask you all a question. What is the maximum size of a photograph that you have ever printed for your reports? Certainly not more than an A4 size. At the most, something if you have presented in the court of law, it would have been 16 by 20, 16 inches by 20 inches. That is a, that is a standard size of a photographic paper. I mean, that's the maximum size that you need to print, right? Now, what, what does megapixel have to do with these uh, print size? Let us see. Now here in the stable, onto the left column is the megapixels that are required to make a print of a standard size which you see in red brackets there on the right. Now say we talked about the highest size of 15 by 10 or 18 by 12 which appears into the last line there. You need a maximum of 22 megapixels. You don't need any camera bigger than this to make an 18 by 12 inch print. And that 18 by 12 print which, uh, print, which is like your A4 a4 size paper is good enough to present in the court of law and what all that you need is a 22 megapixel camera but that's a rare case not not all surveyors uh, handle uh, are, are uh, expert witnesses or they are amicus curie that is the friends of the court where they give pictures the, the, the maximum size that you need is 8 by 6 for your report which you would be putting into your uh, onto your uh, letterhead and uh, giving across for that all that you need is a 4 to 8 megapixel camera so you know it's 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 a big myth that you need a 40 megapixel camera you need a 36 megapixel camera to get a good uh, picture well with a 40 megapixel or a 36 megapixel you certainly will get a good picture at the at, at the cost of dollars pounds rupees whatever it is they are going to be pricier cameras so you got to find a proper median between what is your need and what your equipment is able to give you so if you find any decent camera which gives you 12 megapixels, it's good enough for the survey aspects. You don't need anything bigger than that. If you if you look in the table, even a 12 megapixel camera will give you a good 12 by 8. That is a little smaller than an A4 size print, which is good enough for us. So just, just don't get caught into this megapixel war where the manufacturers are giving you higher megapixels at the cost of dollars just because they want to sell something. No, if you have something uh, which is between 8 and 12 megapixels or 6 and 12 megapixels, good enough. You don't need anything more than that. So what's the final verdict? What is the camera that uh, you would choose? Well, I, I'm not going to give you an answer to this because each one of us has different and unique requirements. So we've got to understand what is our requirement or what kind of work that we are doing and then go and uh, choose a camera. But yet, I would say that analyze your needs and research the market before you buy the camera. Because 
these days, every six months, there's a new um, improved version of the older model that comes into the market. A small difference in the price tag, but maybe that, that improved version may have a feature which is very much needed into your line of work. So if that's the case, by all means, go and buy the newer model. If not, stick to what you have. Analyze the market, research the market. You know what best you need for yourself on the field. No better judge than yourself. What is the latest today may become technologically absolute tomorrow. And that's happening. Cameras that I purchased two years down the line, two years before. Today, if I go and buy lenses for them, I don't get the lenses because that, that camera is no longer being manufactured. And uh, the lenses that are compatible with it are no longer being manufactured. So what was the use of getting the latest one that I brought then, which is obsolete today. So that's, that's what was happening into this digital imaging market markets. That every model that comes within a matter of year and a half, two years, it's obsolete. It, there are no longer accessories and lenses available for them. So that, that brings us to a very important point here. Now, this is not paid marketing. I'm not endorsing any brand. I'm not being paid for endorsing any brand. So that's a key here. Go with some reputed brand names. And, and those reputed brand names, I would say, go, by, go with the cameras made of Canon, Nikon, Olympus, Fuji, um, Sony out these days. These are brands which have stood the test of time. They have more or less a common platform around which all their models are built. There are several other brands, you know, fly-by-night kind of brands. They come in cheap models, high megapixels. They'll sell a few hundred cameras and simply vanish away. Uh, choose not to buy them because tomorrow, if say if there are 10 surveyors into your uh, office and you have a, a common brand of cameras amongst all 10 of them, it is very easy to interchange lenses and equipment between uh, all of those surveyors. It becomes very easy to handle things. Uh, that the platform being similar, you pick up this camera or that camera of the same brand, it will have uh, the controls and features more or less which are similar to on both of them. It's easier for you as a surveyor to go and uh, take pictures. You don't have to fiddle with the camera. So that's the that's plus point of having a branded uh, product line when it comes to cameras. So this is, this is all about choosing your cameras very, very, very wisely. Because if you do that wisely, there's no reason why you will have to change equipment quite frequently. I mean, I'll, I'll show you some, some things. Now I have this small little camera. I've been using this camera for almost uh, about eight, eight years plus. Doesn't mean that this is the only camera. Yes, I have, I have a range of cameras that are with me depending on what kind of surveys I go on to. I pick up uh, the right equipment and I go, but yes, cameras like this can go on for years together provided you choose them uh, wisely. So, so choose wisely. See, understand what you need, understand what is available in the market, which camera actually fits into that particular slot of your work and go and buy that camera. And we have seen what are the pros and cons. We have seen what are the plus points uh, of each one of them and what you should consider while buying. So that should help you uh, make a wise decision. Now, having uh, purchased a camera, it becomes equally important that you should uh, know how to operate it. That the op the operator's manual or the user's manual is pretty much uh, self-explanatory these days for all these cameras. But there are some finer points which I would like to bring to your attention. That if these, these, these are about 22 tips which I would give you to get the most out of your cameras. And I'll tell you as a surveyor why those tips or why those particular aspects are important and how they impact us as surveyors if, if and when used correctly. Now, there are certain setup tips. Out of these 22 tips, certain tips are setup tips. Now, what are these setup tips when you, when you switch on a camera? Obviously, you get a menu mode. There is, there is a menu button always into the camera. If you go onto that menu mode, there are certain settings if you set them right. Uh, that sets a proper work protocol. You know, when we go out for surveys, we have a proper survey protocol, right? This is what we got to do. This is what we got to check. This is what we got to collect. This is what we got to perform. Same thing happens when it comes to digital imaging. Also. So let's see what those setup tips are. The first and very important is always format your memory card. Whenever you're out for a new assignment and considering and assuming that you have downloaded all the pictures from the pre previous assignment onto your laptop or your PC, always format the memory card because what it does is formatting the memory card, it, it makes things afresh. If the card has 
gone corrupt for some reasons you will come to know at this stage whether the card is good or corrupt if it's corrupt and you have not formatted it you go on to the survey and then realize oh no this this card is just simply not recording images what do i do now you either have to go back to the office and pick up a new card or ask someone to get a new card for you right so if you if you format a memory card whilst you're in the office you will come to know the status of that memory card whether it's working or is it corrupt so that's that's something which should become as a second nature to you whether we are going on to a uh, new survey have your memory card formatted but before that always remember the previous photos that you have taken please download them check your diopter settings now for people and surveyors like me who wear eyeglasses i mean without without my prescription glasses it's very hard for me to see some cameras especially the dslrs this is not applicable to the compacts and the mirrorless but for those of y'all who have a dslr camera near the viewfinder you will find a small little dial now say for example this this kind this this is a kind of a mirrorless camera on a dslr you will find a viewfinder over here on the side there is a small black dial which is called the diopter setting what that diopter setting does is if i if i happen to remove my glasses now i'm i'm unable to see the screen clearly now if i rotate the diopter uh, wheel onto the side of the viewfinder i can actually see through the viewfinder as if i was seeing with my glasses now why is that important sometimes you are working into humid conditions off late with the covid thing when you have the mask on the vapors go and fog your glasses right i mean i i face that problem when i remove my glasses and i adjust the diopter setting to ensure that i am able to now see through the viewfinder as if i would see with my glasses on that helps you work without glasses getting the point so there is there is no loss of sight or even with your glasses you want to correct the diopter settings you can still do that so always if if you are like me who you can't see without glasses please do check your diopter settings on the camera and set it in such a way that you can see through the viewfinder without your glasses it helps in taking tack sharp pictures customize your auto exposure and auto focus buttons now there is a very important thing with digital cameras there is an adage it goes as in photographer's parlance your exposure follows the focus you know most most of these cameras are auto focus cameras now auto focus auto exposure what is it it is basically the intelligence artificial intelligence of the camera which decides how bright the light is how far the subject is and accordingly it exposes the picture now more or less what happens is if if this is my frame of my camera the camera will focus at something which is right in the center and it will also expose for that particular point which is in the center now assume the whole surrounding is dark and there is just one bright spot here say for example it's a G gps screen which is switched on and your frame includes that gps screen and when you take a picture it is the gps screen that is going to be focused and exposed but whereas you as a surveyor would want the whole scene to be uh, crisp and bright you know so because because your camera's exposure is following the focus it is setting the exposure for the focused point now that may not be the requirement at all times you may need the brightness of the background as well as the gps to be sharp focus two different things the background to be sharp and sorry the background to be bright and the gps to be focused so the exposure has to be for the background whereas the focus has to be on the gps in such cases what you need to do is there is a auto exposure auto focus button at the back of the camera which is also called as a back button focusing you set the focus and manually change the exposure to the background now you have the gps screen which is on which is in focus as well as the background which is considerably in uh, good contrast with the gps screen so this is very important now many of us don't pay attention to these small things and we say oh my camera always gives uh, dark images without understanding that that is because your exposure is being directed to the place where the camera has been focused so you can split this two using the auto exposure and auto focus buttons many of the compact cameras these days have a feature called a function button quite often you will have a button uh, onto the camera is called fn i will show you a particular thing see this camera you do you do you see this small little fn button here so this is this is the back button for the uh, 
camera. So if I, if I just press that, it locks my focus and then I can adjust my exposure the way I want, keeping everything in good brightness or good darkness as, as you would want it to be. So master the use of that. It's very important uh, control onto your camera. And most of these uh, good cameras, high end compact cameras will have this. Go through your uh, manual, find out for the function button, FN button, and you can customize this as to what this button can do. So if you customize this well in advance, uh, depending on the kind of work that you do, uh, you can actually make good use of your uh, camera. It's, it's a custom, custom button which you can customize. Ensure your camera system date and location is accurate. See, most of these cameras today have GPS uh, logging uh, facilities. Each of the cameras also has a date imprint and time imprint. We, most of the times we do use it. Many times what happens is for, I, I, I do quite a lot of overseas uh, surveys as well. And when I go overseas, I normally set the date to that particular country, the time to that particular country. And I come back to India and I forget changing it. So what happens on the next assignment that I go, it's making an imprint and date of the previous setting. Now if these pictures have to go in the court of law as evidence. And if I say I did this survey on the 30th of November, whereas the date and time is set to UK time and it is uh, 6.30 in the morning on uh, 30th November, whereas I'm sitting here in uh, India and it's 12.05, that evidence, piece of evidence holds no good because the lawyer is simply going to say, gentlemen, you say you did the survey at 12 o'clock, the photograph says it is 6 o'clock. What is this? So always ensure if you are traveling between places, your date, time and location is set accurately. Very, very important if you do uh, surveys where the cases are likely to go into arbitration and uh, litigations. There is there's another presentation on the same aspect, uh, uh, evidentiary value of digital images, which was presented at the Lloyd's uh, building. Have a, have a go through that particular presentation on the IMS YouTube channel. Very important aspects pointed out therein as well. Adjust your camera sensor cleaning settings. Uh, as I said earlier, if you have a DSLR where you open the lenses quite often to shuffle between uh, different lenses, there's an element of dust and moisture that goes into the camera and then your, your sensor is marred with all those uh, small black specks. Most of the cameras have a sensor cleaning mode. Go into your menu and set a sensor cleaning setting as every time you switch on. You know, there, there, are, there are sensor cleaning modes like switch, uh, clean the sensor every time you switch on, clean the sensor every time you switch off, or clean the sensor when you press the FN button, the function button. So you can, you can actually calibrate and, and, and uh, adjust your camera sensor to be clean the time you want. So every time, I normally, what I do is every time I switch on the camera, I have the sensor clean. So that way, every time I start, my, I ensure that my sensor is free of all dust. It's nothing but a vibration uh, element which is added into the camera, which vibrates the sensor and all the dust falls off. It's as simple as that. But if you, if you, if you calibrate it in such a way that every time you switch on the camera, it will clean off that dust and your sensor is always dust free. So a very valuable feature to, to actually activate into your cameras. And most of these cameras have this. Customize your image modes by adjusting sharpness, saturation, and contrast. See, many times uh, we do find that our images are quite flat. They lack contrast or the colors don't really come up uh, the way they should be or the way you actually see them. So there is a simple feature. Go into the menu, go into the image modes, and you will find three sliders, uh, sharpness, saturation, contrast. Simply adjust them till the time you get good colors. And, and good colors in the sense, not fancy colors. The best thing to do is point at some scene where there are good blues, reds, and yellows, or blue, red, uh, red yellows, and blacks. And till the time when, 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 and those are small sliders. If you slide those sliders with your uh, joystick or that uh, wheel, whatever is on your camera to adjust settings, till the time you see the red as it appears in the scene, same onto your screen, the yellow appearing same as it is on the screen, the blue appearing the same, you will always get colors which are absolutely true as they appear into the scene. Sharpness is also the same thing. You can actually adjust your sharpness sometimes. And, and this, is, this is not something uh, uh, very high technique or something out of the world. It is a simple thing because camera finally is a machine. You need to tell the machine how to operate, right? 
at the startup if you tell the machine and this is something which you have to do once if you tell the camera once this is how i want you to perform it performs like that throughout its life consistently unless you go and change that setting once again so if you do that once it's going to give you consistent uh, images and consistent results all through the life of the camera so very simple thing which very few of them do but do this and and see how how your images start popping up update the camera firmware with digital imaging it's becoming very important to update your camera firmware like like we update our uh, pc softwares or antiviruses your mobile phone operating systems the same is with cameras with new features coming in new bugs being uh, discovered by the users the camera firms are constantly upgrading their camera firmware camera firmware is nothing but an operating system of the camera you just have to be abreast by going on to that uh, camera manufacturer's website and see if there is a latest firmware for your camera if it is there simply download it copy it into your uh, memory card and there will be a direction into your camera manual as to how to upload the firmware the moment you upload the firmware all features of your camera which at one point of time were not functioning properly or have gone erratic will automatically get reset and they will come back on track but once you do this you may have to do everything of the above that i said because that's like resetting or rebooting your uh, computer with a new software so you have to do your settings again so but it's always important to do this firmware update melinda just uh, melinda mike just popping in uh yes. 10 minutes please sure yeah okay thank you so you should always turn off the battery draining functions Uh, if you don't need the GPS, turn off the GPS. If you don't need the Wi-Fi in the camera, turn it off. If you don't need the Bluetooth, turn it off because that's going to save your battery life. It's going to optimize the battery life and give you more images per uh, charge of the battery. Set the LCD brightness to auto mode. So if you're shuffling between outdoors to indoors, outdoors to indoors into a boat outside the boat, if you adjust the LCD brightness to auto, automatically uh, the LCD will sense the ambient light and display the picture or or the settings the way they are so it gives you a less strain on your eyes so that's another feature it also optimizes battery life now there are some shooting tips which we should uh, follow when we are taking pictures enable framing level what is framing level in most of the cameras you will have a sort of a horizon line you go into the settings and go into the display aspect of the camera menu and you will find this framing level it's framing if your if your camera is tilted uh, to one side that, that it's like as as what you call that uh, level bubble uh, the line will go skewed so you can always ensure that your camera is perfectly horizontal uh, when you are taking pictures enable a framing grid what is a framing grid see i'll i'll just show you what a framing grid is if you if you can see this okay can you can you see those uh, square lines on to the screen there that is a framing grid now wh why is that framing grid important as as small craft surveyors you are taking a picture of a boat right from the bow and if your camera is slightly tilted your your mast is going to look skewed to one side right so if you have a framing grid you can always ensure that the verticals are verticals when compared to that grid so it's it's nothing but a guideline for you to compose your pictures they give you better pictures enable lcd touch controls are available Uh, why is this important? Because sometimes uh, it's difficult to uh, see in the dark, especially if you're shooting in the dark. So if you have many, many of these uh, cameras these days have camera operations controlled onto the touch screen LCD. Enable these uh, touch screens, so the menu is much more easier onto the LCD screen than scrolling with that little wheel and a joystick. Shoot in RAW and JPEG mode, as I said earlier. We have to always shoot. If if you are doing uh, work for legal cases, you should also ensure that you shoot in. raw and jpeg because raw images if they are untouched you can prove the evidentiary value and the originality of the jpeg images with raw files there is a detailed article also onto this in one of these uh, report magazines which i can share with you all someday onto the email if you need one you can always get back to me i will share that with you all. enable the histogram display now uh, this is not so important unless you are deep into photography histogram display is only the level of uh, brightness across the frame so if you have this histogram display it's nothing like it it's but a graph of light uh, if you if you uh, have this on you will immediately know whether your photograph is underexposed or overexposed so that way in case if you have to retake a picture 
to expose it correctly, you can find it out and uh, come to know using a histogram this way. Use the least number of autofocus points. On most of the cameras, you will have nothing less than six autofocus points. On advanced cameras, you may have up to 96 autofocus points. Now, what are autofocus points? Across the LCD screen, there will be several points on which the camera will try to focus. Now, just imagine if there are 96 autofocus points. The camera is trying to assess each of those 96 uh, points and try and focus. And it wastes time. So as a surveyor, we don't need 96 focus points. 96 focus points are good for people who, who capture F1 races and kind of fast moving subjects across the, across the scene. We don't do something like that. Our, most of our subjects are stationary, right? We are, we are capturing something that's stationary. So just about six autofocus points are good enough. So reduce the autofocus points from whatever you have onto your camera to a bare minimum of six. That should solve your purpose. That will make your image making a little more faster and much more precise. Expand your ISO range. If, if there is a setting onto your camera where you can expand the ISO range to a higher limit beyond say 800 or 1600, please do that. That will give you a capability to take pictures even in low light, low light conditions. Set up the minimum shutter speed. As a thumb rule, if you shoot anything slower than one by 30th of a second, the photograph is going to be blurred. So that there are minimum shutter speed settings into your camera, set it that it should never go below one by 30th. Because most of the time, we, we have, as surveys, we don't use tripods, right? We always uh, go and uh, do handheld shooting. Set your minimum shutter speed to one by 30th. So the camera never goes below one by 30th, ensuring that your images are not blurred. So it's a very val valuable thing to do. Set up the ex exposure bracketing for three to five shots. Now what is exposure bracketing? Say you have, you're shooting a white, boat, a side of a white boat, and, and it's too bright and sunny. Now, sometimes the camera is tricked by the kind of light which keeps changing, that there's a cloud moving around, and it, the, the lighting situation is not uniform. In such conditions, there is an exposure compensation mode in every camera, every digital camera. If need be, you can activate that exposure bracketing between three and five shots. All what it does is it takes a base exposure and gives you two shots brighter and two shots darker than the ambient scene. So making, giving you an option to choose the right, rightly exposed picture later on when you want to uh, put it into the uh, report. So that, that, that's a way to help your, the surveyor to ensure that he gets a correctly exposed picture. Always use this. Then the battery and memory card tips. Protect the ends of your spare batteries. If, if you're always carrying a spare battery, uh, with a spare battery, you'll get a plastic cap which comes onto the side. Always always keep that cap on because if, you're, if your uh, battery terminal is short, there is a chance of uh, the battery draining off, which is not good. You have a charged battery and it uh, accidentally shorts. You, you have a pen that touches it and it starts draining off. So keep your ends of spare batteries covered. Use the highest capacity and type of memory card. We discussed this. Now, this is, this is something what a memory card looks like. Now, uh, I hope everyone knows what those pictures, uh, what those numbers look like. That 64 GB is the maximum capacity. The 300 below the 64 GB is the uh, maximum reading speed. At what speed? That is 30 MB per second is the reading speed. To the right side, uh, you will see that 299 is the maximum uh, writing speed. That is 299 MB per second is the speed at which it can write. So choose a right. Uh, memory card, the fastest memory card that you can accommodate in your camera. That way you will ensure that uh, the turnover of the images between shooting and saving is much more faster, making you a little more efficient. If your camera accepts inline charging, consider a power bank. As I said, if, if your camera can only charge with the USB drive, consider having a power bank uh, along with you so that you can always charge the camera between two consecutive, uh, you know, consecutive shots. Reduce your image review time. If possible, turn it off. See, we always have a tendency that we take a picture and have a look at the LCD. It's, it's okay, fine, not a problem. But keep that image reviewing time as short as possible. If possible, turn it off. If you're confident of what you have taken, turn it off. Better. It will save your uh, battery life. It will give you a longer battery life. Now, that big brings us to a very, those were 22 tips, by the way. Uh, this brings us to an important aspect of digital image asset management. Now, this is not only with relation to your photographs. This is any digital asset, your files, your Excel files, your Word files, reports, whatever digital files that you make, including your digital image, this is applicable. Now, in the uh, life cycle of a digital file, 
there are four steps one is you create a file second is you manage it third is you distribute it and fourth is you preserve it now when you make a word file or you let's let's talk in terms of uh, digital imaging when you take a picture you create a file right or wrong we, we always create a, a file later on we manage the file means we we bring it back to the office we save it on the onto the computers we we put in comments for each photograph what this photograph was about where was this taken what for uh, what was it taken for etc etc then we distribute it right it's not always that i would uh, i would make uh, the photographic annexer i might list out the pictures uh, the numbers of the pictures and give it to my secretary and ask her to make a photo um, compendium to go along with the report so someone it has to be distributed to someone so i should know whom i am distributing it to and after it's been distributed and everything is done i need to preserve that file later on for my archives right so that's that's the basic life cycle of uh, the digital file to create manage distribute and preserve so what are the seven golden rules of uh, the digital files life cycle first is shield your data like anything i mean we we would protect anything that we have right so shield your data basically the moment you come out after your survey onto the onto the uh, memory card there is a lock button we'll see a small slider simply put it on lock shield it from being accidentally overwritten or deleted that way you are shielding your data always ensure you do that safeguard your data there is a very good rule called 3 to 1 rule there should be always three copies of your uh, digital assets or your images or your files two should be on two separate media and one should be offsite so what does that mean when i come back from my assignment with a set of pictures i copy these pictures onto three different medias out of which one may be my laptop one may be my external hard drive and third may be a different backup which is saved off site which is not in my office which is either in a data warehouse or say for example in my home which i i might be saving it so three to one principle three copies two on different uh, medias one off site always remember that backup supporting documents see uh, when it comes to uh, taking digital images there is a article on to this as well as to you should have a workflow as to who does what after after shooting the pictures who downloads it who who distributes it to whom is it distributed your pictures this is more so important when you are dealing with legal cases believe me and I, that's that's out of my own experience that i'm saying you should have supporting documents for your images that was there a proper permission to take these pictures when were these pictures taken when were they downloaded there there is a proper excel worksheet which i have prepared which i can share with people uh, through my later on and which 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 is my workflow if you all can adopt that workflow it's very easy to uh, document the evidentiary value of an image you should have backups plus archives now these are two different things backups are different archives are different backups are something which i have done onto my computer i have another copy of it which is a backup now after the survey assignment is complete say after a year or so i have this copy plus the backup plus i will archive everything to an offsite uh, computer or an offsite uh, data center which doesn't get touched it should anything happen to my two backups i always have that archive coming the same 3 to 1 principle check and update your data see many a times you uh, we are all aware i mean we started with windows 3.1 then came windows xp then came windows 7 and 10 and it's it's always evolving right the same is with digital files what jpeg images were uh, could be seen on 3.1 probably they may not be seen on windows 10 it's it's possible it does happen it, it happens with most of us older files are not compatible with the newer files there is a small patch somewhere with the software uh, uh, the manufacturer or the software code writer he has that patch where you can have reverse uh, compatibility so check your data always for such kind of compatibility if you have been uh, capability if you have been using older software systems and there are new software systems that have come into your office maybe your old data cannot be read here there may be a small patch which you need to download so always do this um, what you call as cross platform uh, check whether your data is still valid or not very important otherwise someday you will find that you are just the data is there but you are not able to read it build in build a routine and stick to it same thing what i said in uh, point number 3 that you have to build a routine as to how you are going to do this once you do those things document them and stick to them so that everybody in the office is at 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 the same platform and doing the same things in the same way as they are supposed to be it's it's like an iso documentation make it known document it let all your peers let all your subordinates know what the process is document it once it is document uh, 
if the document helps everyone to understand the whole process, then there is less uh, chance of anyone faltering and going astray from the documented procedure. And as I said, there are further resources available with IIMS. There's a book on digital imaging. There's, there are a few uh, presentations on digital imaging. It would be worthwhile to go through those because that will give us a broader outlook and, and understanding of all what we discussed. Should you further have any uh, questions? Yes, please do uh, put forth your questions in the chat right now. Else, if you are watching this uh, offline later on as a recorded presentation, do get in touch with me on milintambe at gmail.com and I'll be more than happy to answer your questions. And that was it, Mike, and I, the forum is open for question answers. Thank you.